welcome to the Paleozoic. Today we are going to explore the strange and wonderful life forms that inhabited those ancient times. And uh, one of the big things that occurred during the Paleozoic that makes it different from the life forms in the Precambrian is we see a major development of hard parts, shells and things like that. And uh, this important development uh, increases the preservation potential of fossils. So we start seeing and, uh, more life forms because they're better preserved. And um, the thing about this, this major advance in, uh, in life, we don't exactly know why it happened. We're not sure why uh, life began developing hard parts, but it happened. And some of the earliest uh, life forms we see with these are these things that we call small shelly fossils. That's seriously the name we have for them. And they show up in the late Neoproterozoic and exist into the early Cambrian. We don't exactly know what life they're related to, what life forms, so we don't know the exact taxonomy. But they're there and they're some of the early things that developed hard parts. And in the Cambrian, uh, one thing very uh, noticeable also is we get a lot of um, metazoans, remember those larger multicellular organisms. And this, this appearance of all these larger multicellular organisms is called the Cambrian Explosion. And I wrote that it's a seemingly abrupt appearance because for a long time we uh, did not know about some of the older metazoans uh, that inhabited the Neoproterozoic, like those uh, Ediacaran fauna organisms. But basically, in the Cambrian explosion, we see all major invertebrate phyla except the bryozoans. They come along a little bit later. And um, why did the Cambrian explosion happen when it did? Well, there's a few possible causes. Um, there's more ozone in the atmosphere, which does offer a measure of protection from uh, UV radiation. There is more oxygen in the atmosphere for these organisms. And remember, we just came out of some Snowball Earth episodes. And so it could also be that we just have a nicer climate at this time. And some of the um, important organisms that we see at this time belong to what's called the Burgess shale fauna. Um, every now and then in geology we have these just really important groups of animals like that Ediacaran fauna of the Precambrian. Well of the Cambrian the Burgess shale fauna is important. It's in the middle Cambrian it includes a lot of soft body organisms but it does also include some with shells we have all kinds of uh, different organisms, arthropods and sponges, these weird things, onychophorans, crinoids, mollusks, worms, chordates, and beasties of unknown phyla. Some of them are shown here on my nice t-shirt. And some of the interesting ones were like this guy. This is called Wewaxia. And uh, when people originally found this fossil of Wewaxia, um, they actually thought that it like walked on the ground like this, but uh, ended up that it actually moved, uh, it lived in the ocean, and it basically would walk along the seafloor like this, and these were probably for some sort of uh, protection. And, um, and what makes this Burgess shale fauna so uh, interesting to paleontologists is we actually see both predators and prey animals. And um, it's thought that another one of those reasons hard parts developed or the weird little spines on that were waxy and stuff is that predation might have influenced the development of hard parts because um, it became something defensive for organisms to have. So the Burgess shale fauna is important to us because like I said we have all kinds of different animals and we have both predators and prey and we're seeing that interaction between those. This is the Burgess shale. This is often uh, in Canada in a place called Yoho National Park. And there we see a, a, 
um, artist's rendition of what uh, the Burgess shale animals would have looked like. There we see some of those little Wawaxias that I was showing you. There's also things like trilobites. And there's this very important predator in there. And that guy's Animalicaris, and you can see how large that predator could get compared to a six-foot person there. And so this is a major predator of that um, Cambrian time period. Now, um, when we leave the Cambrian and enter the Ordovician, life, um, life really diversifies. And we call this the Ordovician biodiversification event. And we see a major increase in species, genus, family, and order levels. And in fact, global diversity tripled in about 25 million years during this event. Uh, which leaves paleontologists wondering, why? Why would that happen? Well, there was a small extinction event in the late Cambrian. And um, that extinction event might have opened ecological niches for new organisms to diversify and then occupy. But then remember, in the Ordovician, we had these warm, shallow, epicontinental seas. They're very nutrient-rich. Um, phytoplankton's abundant. So it just might have been kind of the, the perfect environment for this diversification to occur. Now, as I go through different life forms of the Paleozoic, I'm going to be um, using some terms to describe their life strategies. So these are some terms I want you guys to remember. Um, and some of them we already went over back when I first introduced fossils and fossilization, but let's just have a nice little review then. So we have epifaunal, means it's on the seafloor. Infaunal is burrowing into the seafloor sediments. Sessile means that it is stationary, it's attached to something, it doesn't move around. Vagrant means it moves around. Filter feeders strain organic matter or microorganisms out of water. Sediment feeders actually um, eat muds on the sea floor and basically extract the nutrients from that. Herbivores graze on plants or cyanobacteria. Carnivores are meat eaters, and then scavengers go after things that are already dead. So let's then take a look at um, life and different life forms that existed in the Paleozoic. We're going to start with our protozoans. Protozoans are single-celled organisms, and um, a major group of these are the foraminifera. They show up in the Cambrian and they still exist today. And these are really, really tiny shells, which paleontologists call tests, and they have little chambers inside of them. And most of these are made from uh, calcium carbonate. And uh, when we went over the calcareous ooze that accumulates on the seafloor, remember that? Well, this makes up some of that calcareous ooze. Now, in these uh, protozoans, these, these fora foraminifera, which we often call forams for short, there's a group called fusilinids. You saw that in the um, fossil lab. Those were some of those little rice-shaped uh, um, fossils. Well, they're an important index fossil in the late Paleozoic. And here's an example of some of uh, the different forams that you might have. Uh, you guys saw this one, or maybe it was this one, the little grain of rice looking one in the fossil lab. But forams aren't the only uh, single-celled organisms out there. Um, uh, we also have radiolarians. My cats are misbehaving. So, hey, stop that. Joe. All right, um, anyway, radiolarians also show up in the Cambrian and do still exist today. But these guys aren't really that common in the Paleozoic. While they exist in the Paleozoic, uh, they become more abundant and more common in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. 
And these guys uh, create silica skeletons. And they create silica skeletons. And remember that silicious ooze that's on the seafloor? These guys make up some of that silicious ooze. And some of them are quite pretty when you look at them underneath a microscope. Well, I'll be honest though, I'm not that into the fossils of single-celled organisms. I think the multicellular ones are much more interesting. So let's move on to the multicellular ones. We're going to go to archaeocyathids. Archaeocyathids existed from the early to middle Cambrian. So these are actually an excellent uh, index fossil. And they're made from calcite, and they had a double-walled skeleton to them. And they're similar to sponges and corals, but their anatomy is uh, different from sponges and corals. They're benthic, they're sessile, and they live in shallow water. And these guys are a filter feeder. And what we're going to see also in the Paleozoic is that in every time period, reefs are being built. But uh, it's just that the organisms that are making the reefs differ depending what time period we're in. And in this early to middle Cambrian, the reef builders were these archaeocyathids. And they're our first major reef building organism. And um, oftentimes, remember those stromatolites that I talked about, those cyan cyanobacteria? Oftentimes you would have these mats of cyanobacteria and then interspersed among them uh, would be these archaeocyathids growing up. This is what they look like. Um, so when I talk about it having a double wall, we have the inner wall and we have the outer wall here. And there you can see some actually preserved where there's the inner wall and outer wall. And at the bottom of these, these guys have this little holdfast that basically would hold it onto the sea floor. Now, very similar to uh, the archaeocyathids are uh, sponges, which belong to phylum Porifera. And these evolved from single-celled colonial organisms that then um, basically became ultimately this multicellular but still very, very simple organism. Now, sponges, for the most part, are very squishy and kind of soft, but they do have a rigid part to them, and we call this rigid part of them spicules. And these spicules might be made up of silica, they might be made up of calcite, or they might be made up of, uh, oops, I have a spelling error, uh, something called spongin. So take the G off that. Spongin, not sponging. Um, they don't have any true organ systems, though. And so they are a very, very simple organism. They are a filter feeder. They basically eat whatever happens to be floating by. And um, while their larva is planktonic, their larva floats around, once we have the uh, adult organisms, they're benthic and they're sessile. They just simply live on the sea floor. An important group of sponges in the Paleozoic are the stromatoporoids. And these were a calcareous, so that's the calcite uh, sponge. They're a colonial one. And in the Ordovician to the Devonian, these guys are the important reef builder. Remember, those archaeocyathids went extinct, and this becomes the next reef building organism. And this is a typical sponge. That's a fossil of one, and this is um, kind of the, uh, what the sponge organism looks like. They have just this um, very simple structure and um, uh, take in water and filter out whatever it is that uh, they might want or might uh, need to eat. Now, nadaria, um, phylum nadaria includes jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. And uh, what makes all of these, um, um, what, uh, what makes all of these similar is they have what are called nidocytes. 
These are special cells that sting. And um, their ectoderm, that means their outermost uh, co uh, covering, does have some primitive sensory cells in it. Now, both of these, uh, or all of these, have a um, vagrant medusa form and a polyp form that is sessile, that is stationary. So uh, basically, the coral, if you have a coral, it looks like this. And if you zoom in on a coral, it's going to have little tentacles, the organism. It has its mouth right there. This is its gastrovascular cavity. That's where the food goes. Uh, and a jellyfish is simply the coral kind of upside down, where now the tentacles are hanging there, but there's its mouth, there's that gastrovascular cavity. Um, coral, um, corals, they're... Um, their larva stage is vagrant. It floats around kind of like the jellyfish. And then it, uh, it becomes stationary and turns into a coral in its adult form. But in any case, just remember, corals and jellyfish are relatives. And, um, and the coral is basically just the, uh, the, the one that sits there, whereas the jellyfish ends up moving around. Um, now, corals are classified. There's many different types of corals that exist. And they're classified by skeletal characteristics called septa and tabulae. And, um, and where the actual coral organism lives is called the theca. So let's look at what these different um, skeletal characteristics are. The septa are vertical plates in the theca, and the tabulae are horizontal plates in the theca. So if uh, you saw in, uh, in the fossil lab, you saw some of these horn corals. And um, this is uh, where the coral organism would have lived. And so you can see septa in there, and you can see tabulae in there. This is a colonial coral. Coral Again, there's the septa, and there's those horizontal tabulae. And when we look at our coral types, the, um, the horn corals that I was just mentioning, those are called rugose corals, or sometimes called tetracorals. And they were solitary, meaning there's just one coral organism in each one of these things. And uh, the septa in them, they're called the tetracorals because the septa added in multiples of four. These become some reef builders in the Devonian to the Carboniferous. So you're starting to see how different organisms are building reefs uh, at different times in the um, Paleozoic. Unfortunately, uh, rugose corals go extinct at the end of the Permian, so we no longer have this type of coral with us today. Is there a question? And this is what they, uh, I'm sorry, I'm used to asking if there's questions. It's so strange not being able to talk to you guys. But anyway, these are some of the rugose corals. Um, and you can see why they're called horn corals. And right there, that's where the little coral organism would have lived. Now we also have a group of corals called scleractinid corals, or hexacorals. And hexacorals, because their septa are added in multiples of six. Now these guys are from the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic, so they, uh, we, don't, we don't worry about these guys in the Paleozoic. Uh, in the Paleozoic, though, we do have some other corals, including the tabulate corals. And these guys don't have very well-developed septa, but they have really nicely developed tabulae. And uh, that's why they're called tabulate corals. These only exist in the Paleozoic. And in the Silurian, they were building reefs. These guys are uh, very important Silurian reef builders. And this is what they look like. And you can see those little tabulae Right? Those little horizontal uh, parts to that coral in there. All right, bryozoans. Bryozoans are um, a colonial animal that is similar, um, 
to a coral. They, they kind of live in these, these um, uh, colonies all together and there's little organisms in there. But if we look at their um, anatomy, their anatomy is better developed than the coral organisms. And these bryozoans grow in colonies called a zoarium and the individual animal is called a zooid. And the little place where the individual animal lived is called the zoetium. And this is this tiny little pinpoint depression where the animal lived. And like I said, they're more, uh, they're, they're better developed than corals. Um, their digestive tract, they have a complete one. In a coral, basically their mouth is also their anus which that's pretty interesting, but in a bryozoan, it has a separate mouth and anus, so it, they have a full, complete digestive tract. And these guys show up in the Ordovician, and we still have them with us today. And this is what a uh, bryozoan colony looks like. You saw some of those in the fossil lab. And if we zoom in on that, right there, those are those little places um, uh, where the uh, individual bryozoan animal lives. And this is six millimeters by six millimeters, so very, very small. Uh, so these are tiny little microscopic, uh, practically little animals. And uh, I think we're going to end volume one there, and we'll come back looking at brachiopods.